Welcome to The O Show. I'm Laura Babcock and joining us again here on the program is none other than Mike Schreiber. He is the leader of the Ontario Green Party. And I got to say, Mike, your party is small but mightier and getting mightier by the day. And it's wonderful to have you back on The O Show. Hey, Laura, it's wonderful to be back on. And today's a really special day. Uh, our newest MPP, Ashlyn Clancy from Kitchener Center, uh, just gave her maiden speech and asked her first question today at Queen's Park. So pretty exciting day. Yeah, that's what I mean. You're getting bigger as we go. <laughs> so tell me, Mike, last time I had you on the show, it was right at the height of the green belt scandal. And when I looked back at it today, when we were talking, we were up in arms. There were big protests happening, trying to get that land back from the grab by the Ford government and his pals. Uh, and uh, we succeeded at that. So before we go forward about the current risk to the green belt, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge all the hard work that you played, all that hard work that you did and the role that you played in the Green Party in getting those lands back into the green belt. Having said that, though, uh, Ford just uh, opened up the new session of the legislature with a bizarre big new bill, the, um, what is it, making it work, making it not work, making it work badly. And what are you calling it, Mike? And what risk does it pose to the green belt? Well, I'm calling it the get it done wrong act uh, because that's exactly what it's doing. It's it's taking Ontario in the wrong direction. And or you're so right about um, the citizens movement uh, that just generated the people power to push the Ford government to reverse their you know, deal that would have opened the green belt for development. So a handful of wealthy, well-connected Ford insiders could cash in $8.3 billion at our expense. And I think it was a huge victory for the people of Ontario. And, you know, I was just honored to play a role in that, but it really was the people of Ontario and all the organizations that came together to protect our farmlands, forests, wetlands uh, in the green belt. And adjacent to that, was what I called Greenbelt 2.0, which was the Ford government enforcing urban boundary expansions on the municipalities that did not want them, um, which in a sense was designed once again to help land speculators cash in at the expense of the people of Ontario. And this Get It Done Wrong Act actually reinstates some of those uh, urban boundary expansions that the Ford government backtracked on. So they they said they were going to do it, then they backtracked on it. Now they're going to do it again on, on a number of them. And what's so outrageous about it is, is there are numerous studies, including the government's own Housing Affordability Task Force, who have clearly shown that land is not what is creating the housing crisis. We have enough land already approved for development that not only build 1.5 million homes, which I think we all agree we need to build, but to build 2 million homes. As a matter of fact, I've put forward a bill to legalize housing that would allow for multiplexes and four-story buildings as of right in existing neighborhoods. And I had a builder come to me and they've done an analysis and not that, you know, we're going to only solve the housing crisis with multiplexes, but to, their analysis is that if only 18% of existing single family homes became a multiplex, that would be 2 million homes homes that ordinary people could afford in the communities they know and love without us having this expensive sprawl agenda paving over our farmlands, forests, and wetlands. Well, you're being generous as always, Mike, because you said Ford said that he was going to do the green belt, then wasn't going to do the green belt, then going to do it again through all of this. He actually said originally on camera he wasn't going to touch the green belt. So <laughs> he's taken us around this yes. thing four times. Uh, he continues to have a fire hose of scandals coming at us and i want to try to deconstruct them a little bit with you because honestly my head is spinning with all of the lies and all of the numbers and all of the bogus business cases but focusing on the green belt just for a moment we have a situation that's flaring in hamilton right now and because hamilton is so critical to preserving the green belt and and you know so much of our housing within that urban boundary 
has been fought for. There's a situation right now you may or may not be aware of, but I just want to bring to your attention where um, council was tasked with going forward to find places for affordable housing, found a couple of municipal parking lots that were zoned for it, and then a community backlash got council uh, to lose the vote in committee. And we're very much hoping that by the next council meeting, one of those people on council, hopefully the former minister of housing, Ted McMeekin from the liberal government days, is going to change their mind. But the big concern to me is not just the precedent that it sets for other neighborhoods that don't feel like change for the sake of affordable housing, but it threatens the green belt. Because if we can't build up within our, our urban boundary, um, we're already, to your point, kind of under assault by the Ford government with all of these moves to get that land one way or another. And if council isn't sending the message that we're going to develop where we can on that land that we already have, I'm quite worried about it. Do, do you have a take or a thought on that for us, Mike? Yeah, multiple thoughts. So first of all, I just want to compliment Hamilton because Hamilton really was the first city to push back on these enforced urban boundary expansions. And Hamilton, I think, played a critical role in pushing back on the Greenbelt giveaway. Uh, so I'm disappointed to learn that uh, council said no to a, 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 a housing affordability project. I will say I'm proud of my riding in Guelph and maybe We'll offer a little advice of our experience in Guelph for Hamilton. And I realize it's a little more complicated in Hamilton because it's a larger city with multiple um, ridings. But one of the things that helped us get to yes in Guelph on three major permanent supportive housing projects, one of them focused on youth, which will make us the first city in a larger city in Ontario that will eliminate youth homelessness, was that all three levels of government, the mayor, the MP, and, and um, myself, the MPP, were all aligned in support of these deeply affordable permanent supportive housing projects with wraparound mental health addictions and, and other supports for folks. Um, and having that alignment at all three levels of government, combined with private sector partners, social service agencies, nonprofit uh, agencies uh, all coming together and having kind of a united front to get to yes really made a difference because we did have some initial neighborhood opposition and we all took the time to listen to that opposition, answer people's questions, address it, and help the city get to a unanimous vote to say yes to those affordable housing projects. And the third point I'll make is part of the reason I've put forward uh, a bill to legalize housing is that if we can make four story uh, and four plexes as of right uh, in all existing neighborhoods across the province, and if we can make six to 11 story buildings as of right along major transit corridors, then it sort of takes a lot of that neighborhood controversy out, out of the picture and it has us start building gentle density and missing middle housing, which is what we desperately need. And with what is the most affordable because municipalities then don't have to spend billions of dollars on infrastructure for sprawl. We're actually building where the infrastructure already is. And that then breathes more life into our communities and just builds more vibrant communities that um, create more housing choices for all kinds of people, no matter what stage of life they're in. Uh, I love that. And just, I love your enthusiasm. Just so you know, um, every time you get excited, I think you move your microphone a bit. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I just want to make sure that we don't lose some of our yep. audience who've been anticipating this program because of the audio. When you mentioned uh, the alignment, I think that sounds amazing. I, I'm a little concerned with our political makeup in our city that we can make that happen. But I, I take the note from you, and I think all municipalities across Ontario who are watching would agree that that's what it's going to take, right? These housing projects are the responsibility of all levels of government. I think all have failed and uh, to meet the need and to anticipate the need. And now we are where we are. And your comment about youth in homelessness, Mike, as you know, there's a, a lot of homelessness in Hamilton. And just yesterday yep. I was downtown with a leading a training course in media with a bunch of people from across the province, executives. We were right down at the Hamilton Club where, you know, business comes to do its work kind of thing. And I was approached by three different youth and homelessness while I was waiting my two minutes for an Uber outside of the club. And, you know, because I work now with people in homelessness, I was able to talk to them and share resources with them. But honestly, if I 
was coming into the city or doing business, I would be very concerned. And I think the, the conversation around the need for housing and the need to lift people out of homelessness, youth and other demographics, we're seeing seniors in homelessness for the first time now, yep. a lot of them, right? Um, and I've seen families in the food line. It's, it's heartbreaking. And so we, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a moral imperative, of course, to help our neighbors and to lift others uh, because you can transition to supportive housing and out of homelessness. But there's also an economic need, like, yeah. like just a practical need to make our cities safer and to make everybody housed. And so I just, it, it boggles my mind when I see governments perpetuous, uh, perpetually funding other initiatives for economic development. And, you know, rah, 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 Ontario, it's happening here as Ford is spending a ton of our money on. Um, but not addressing the critical issues around housing and homelessness uh, that and our environment that are going to create the climate for a successful province. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I hear you on that. And, you know, one of the things that I find so distressing is that 93% uh, of our deeply affordable homes were built before 1995. So think about that. No wonder the housing affordability crisis has been getting so much worse. No wonder we're seeing more people unhoused and sleeping rough. And what happened in 1995 is when the provincial government um, on the heels of the federal government got out of building deeply affordable housing. And so we need both the federal and provincial governments to step up to the plate and put money on the table to once again support nonprofit co-op, support even social housing. So we can build those deeply affordable homes that people desperately need. And we need to make sure that we have the health supports for those who need the mental health addictions and other supports uh, within supportive housing so they can maintain their housing. And we know that poverty costs this province $33 billion a year. And, you know, uh, extra burns onto our healthcare system, our, our first responders, our criminal justice system, our social services, et cetera. I was just talking to the Guelph Fire Department, uh, some firefighters the other day, and they were telling me that they have three to four calls every day to an encampment because of some concern around safety. Imagine if those resources actually just went into housing people in the first place. And so to me, it would be so much more fiscally responsible to actually house people, to actually end poverty. And then, and then not only does it benefit those people's lives, but it saves the province $33 billion a year. And your point about the business climate is so important because I can't tell you how many businesses in the downtown core of you know, the city I represent, Guelph, but in so many other cities I talk to, that uh, businesses are being hurt because of the intersecting crisis of mental health addictions and homelessness. And so we can improve the local economy, support local businesses, most importantly, improve people's lives if we end poverty and we make sure everyone has a human right to safe, affordable housing. And I think it is the crisis of our time. It is, it is the challenge for every mayor and for every MPP uh, and every MP, frankly, to address this. Because as someone who used to run the Oakville Chamber of Commerce, Mike, I can tell you that the, you know, the, the success of small business is so interrelated with the environment around the business, right? Uh, and bringing foot traffic and BIAs and chambers can do all kinds of things to try to get people to shop local and come downtown and all the rest of it. But if the environment doesn't feel safe, you know, then then you just simply can't get that vibrancy and that economic that economic boom. So, uh, you know, we're having this wonderful discussion about this utopic vision for Ontario that I think most people who have compassion and a knowledge of how the economy works wants to get on. Like, let's get working on this crisis. Yeah. Um, but we are not in that Ontario. You know, the, the premier spent a fortune on Grammy ads and Super Bowl ads on the Canadian stations talking about it's happening here. And, and my response is, yeah, what's happening here under this government sucks. We've got our healthcare system collapsing because of his moves to privatize it and overpaying nurses agencies three times and overpaying for surgeries by unbelievable amounts. I think I saw 300% the other day to private clinics. So not fiscally managing our public system and our access to equitable health care for be, to, 
I think, privatize and profiteer his pals who are profiteering from the pandemic, right? It's moving money into the private sector and the way that it's happening, I think, is deplorable. Uh, so we've got that kind of priority happening with privatization. We've got things like Service Ontario, where small businesses were shut down and the government, you know, redacted its business case, gave them to Staples. Now we're finding out about the true numbers in that business case and yep. they stink. We're hearing that their excuse is, oh, well, you know, we're saving money on leasing costs, which apparently they weren't having to pay before. So it's like we are being deluged with lies uh, and bad numbers and shady business cases, Science Center. Now I guess Kinga is, is taking over that and that and Ontario play. I mean, so you have to sit in that chamber. <laughs> Mike, I've been there once. I don't know how you do it day in and day out when legislation's in session. But I mean, can you unpack this a little bit for us? Because I don't want to give false hope. I don't want to sit here on this program day after day and tell the people of Ontario, you know, we can fight for justice for housing and for people in homelessness and for health care. And knowing at the same time that we're up against a government whose priorities seem to be to privatize, to profit their pals uh, and to mislead the, the people of Ontario. I mean, they're under RCMP investigation just on the green belt. So, I mean, can you kind of, what, what do you say? Hey, to all of us, Mike, what do you say? <laughs> no, I, I think the short answer, Laura, is that we have a government that is really about how do we benefit wealthy insiders who are connected to the premier over putting people first, just ordinary people. And, you know, the Service Ontario is just such an outrageous example of that. So we as taxpayers are going to subsidize staples to renovate their stores to a, a tune of $2 million dollars while we're closing longtime small business owners, you know, people who live in our communities who have been running Service Ontario locations, um, you know, it's just outrageous. You know, you think of what's happening in the healthcare sector. I mean, literally our healthcare sector is on the verge of collapse. Ford government's response is to increase privatization. We know that private nursing agencies are costing our healthcare system hundreds of millions of extra dollars. Why not just pay nurses a fair wage with fair benefits and better working conditions in the first place, investing in publicly funded, publicly delivered health care? I mean, we see other provinces like Quebec and British Columbia, for example, who tried additional privatization and they found out that you pay more for less. So why would Ontario want to go down that road? I think the people of Ontario deserve a health care system that puts people first. Same way in housing. I mean, you know, here we have a government that's really spent the last two years since the Housing Affordability Task Force released their report focused on opening the Greenbelt for development so a handful of wealthy or connected insiders could cash in $8.3 billion instead of building homes that ordinary people can afford in the communities they know and love. And I'm just a little frustrated today, I'll tell you, because the government just pulled a political maneuver, a bill that I have that would actually legalize housing and implement two key recommendations from the Housing Affordability Task Force was supposed to be debated next week. Uh, tons of support from this bill from anti-poverty activists, housing advocates, realtors, home builders, I mean, people across the political spectrum. And the government did a motion to discharge the bill to committee without even having the opportunity to be debated next week. And for me to give a voice for those folks. And so, you know, how, how is that democratic? And, and it, it's not so much about me, like, you know, whatever, but it, it's about people having the opportunity to have a voice in the people's house, in this legislature, and, and to have a government, you know, to use tools like that to shut down the opportunities for those kinds of debates, you know, I think is a, you know, a deterioration, a threat to our democracy, but it really shows you a government that's really not there for ordinary people. And what's so, uh, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that, Mike. Uh, because I know the enthusiasm that you had for that bill and putting solutions on the table that help, as you call it, like ordinary people, millions of us, right? Uh, and so that's that's a real shame. And it's not the first time you, you said that it's a threat to our democracy. I think I've done a program here asking if Ford was becoming autocratic. You know, yeah. with a majority after five years shutting down dissent like that or the ability to even discuss 
and putting out uh, information that's inaccurate or false or lying or redacting or, you know, or these on this omnibus, the, the get it done oh. wrong bill that, I mean, <laughs> this, doesn't this thing effectively open up the lands around the 413, the highway nobody needs, nobody wants, except for Ford's buddies at his daughter's wedding or whatever, like more of the same names from the green bill. I mean, what is the threat there to the environment and to us having something happen in this province that uh, seems frankly autocratic? It's not something that has wide support. Yeah, I mean, this Get It Done Wrong Act, one of the things that's so outrageous about it is, is it's being part of it's designed to dismantle the environmental assessment process even more. I didn't think the Ford government could do more harm, but they figured out a way to do more harm. And you know, they're fast tracking a 10 plus billion dollar highway that will save commuters 30 to 60 seconds. Uh, and, and I think you know, it'll pave over 2,000 acres of farmland, 600 acres of the Greenbelt, cross 85 waterways that are vital uh, to the drinking water in the greater Toronto area uh, to save commuters 30 seconds. When if the government truly wanted to address gridlock, they could pass a bill today so that on Monday, we could pay the tolls of truckers on the 407. We have the 407 that's like, essentially the same as what the 413 is going to be, an underutilized highway, a highway that somebody could land a plane on a couple of years ago. Why not better utilize that ax asset? It would be far less expensive. I mean, we should have never sold off the 407 in the first place, but now we're stuck with that. But at the very least, if we paid the tolls for truckers, we could get goods moving faster. We could reduce gridlock on the 401 at a fraction of the cost of Highway 413 without all of that environmental destruction. And then on top of that, the 413 is going to unleash, unleash expensive sprawl development on all that land, especially the Peel Plain, which is some of the best farmland in North America, at a time when we're losing 319 acres of farmland every day in Ontario. That's our food security, especially at a time when we're facing a climate crisis. And it's a threat to Ontario's $50 billion food and farming sector and the over 800,000 jobs it creates. So Mike, you know, one of the things that I love about you is that uh, you, you're good at identifying the issues, issue identification, but you're also, you seem to be a perennial optimist and you, you always move to solution-based thinking. And I love hearing your solutions to so many of these, these moves that are happening by the Ford government. But you mentioned something about causing harm. And I'm starting to wonder, and maybe I'm just getting way too cynical here, help me out. Um, I'm starting to wonder if harm is the point because there's so much harm happening to so many vulnerable populations and our environment, which harms our children forever. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, is there is there some sort of a, a maliciousness at the heart of this government? Like, at what point? point do they sit back and say yes we like to get donor money and yes we like to do deals with donors and yes we like to profit and yes we like to stay in power and you know whatever uh but boy if people are not able to get access to health care in our er's that are shutting down and have 48 hour wait lists in some places and boy we really are devastating our our farm supply and our environment for our kids futures and boy we really are plunging so many people into homelessness by not funding ODSP properly and by getting rid of rent controls, maybe it's time that we check our hearts. I mean, is, the, is harm the point or are they just sort of stumbling through this cruelty uh, just for money? Yeah, you know, you raise a great question, Laura. And, you know, as the Ontario Green leader, I oftentimes think about the climate crisis and the urgency of addressing it so our children have a livable future. But I think we have a deeper crisis in Ontario right now, and it's a crisis of caring. Mm -hmm. Like, I know Ontarians care for each other more than the government, the Ford government reflects. And I know that we want to care for the people who care for our loved ones by investing properly in our health care system. I know Ontarians don't want people with disabilities to continue to live in legislated poverty on $1,300 a month. Like, who can survive on that? I have people reaching out to my office, uh, accessing um, medical assistance and dying as a disabled person because they simply can't afford just the mental and physical stress of living in legislated poverty. 
Like we have growing tent cities of unhoused folks throughout our communities. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. And I just want to say that I have to believe that we as Ontarians are better than this, that we actually do care for each other. And we simply need a government that's going to reflect the, the caring that exists in our communities and starts investing in the public services that we need to care for our neighbors. And, and so, you know, that's something I'm going to continue to talk about. I'm going to continue to, to fight for because I guarantee you, if we don't care for each other, we're not going to care for the planet and we're not going to solve the climate crisis. And so I think it really starts by building caring communities and having a government that's going to invest in the support, the public, uh, physical and social and environmental infrastructure that's going to build those caring communities that are affordable for people to live in. Wow, that was beautifully said, Mike. And as you were speaking, I was thinking of, you know, not just the mountain of volunteers in Hamilton that I get to work with every week, helping out with homelessness, but I get probably 20 to 50 messages a day about what can we do for affordable housing? What can we do for homelessness? What, what do people need? So you're right. The caring is absolutely in the hearts of the people of Ontario. And uh, so I think you've answered one of the viewer questions about, you know, what can we do? We can create caring communities. I guess though, if I can just do one final kind of strategic question with you, and then I'll let you go, Mike. Given that there are the care is there, and I agree with you, and I think the more that we show that, the more people see the contrast with the Ford government and their their harmful policies and the and the cruelty, um, and and maybe that will seep into the next election, and people will go, I don't want what I've just spent five years or seven years experiencing anymore. This isn't the Ontario I, I believe in, but between now and then, <laughs> what can we do to stop reverse? call out effectively. I mean, I don't want to just give everyone in the province aneurysms and then have them not be able to get medical care. I mean, what can we do um, from your lens to to do what we did with the green belt, which was to make them stop in their tracks? I mean, is it AG? Is it investigations? Is it public rallies? Is it a general strike? I mean, where? what can we do? Yeah, I, I think it's putting uh, maximum pressure on conservative MPPs to let them know that enough is enough. You're not going to take this anymore. Uh, and there's a lot of grassroots organizations. So I think in the healthcare sector, like the Ontario Health Coalition is an example of a grassroots organization mobilizing pushback to the privatization of our healthcare system. You know, I think of uh, the Stop the Sprawl movement uh, and what a great job they did in organizing the pushback uh, to the Greenbelt, uh, $8.3 billion Greenbelt scandal. They're gearing up now to push back against the Get It Done Wrong Act. And so I think of you know, organizations like Environmental Defense, for example, uh, Greenbelt Promise, a small change fund, all coming together as part of, and all the various Stop the Sprawl movements uh, in communities, including in Hamilton, uh, around the province. Um, it's going to take a citizen-led movement. And I know you'll have political leaders like myself and you know, some of my other co opposition colleagues and the other parties, NDP and liberals, who will be there to help organize, help amplify, help bring those voices to Queen's Park. But at the end of the day, it is going to take citizens demanding better and change from this government. And I can tell you, you know, when I would go around Ontario last summer and I saw all the, you know, Doug Ford, keep your Greenbelt promise signs everywhere. And I saw all the rallies that were taking place in the constituency offices of conservative MPPs. It was that kind of pressure that forced the government, combined with you know the three opposition parties getting the Auditor General to investigate the Greenbelt scandal and all those kinds of things. But it was all that working together that forced the Ford government to reverse course. And I we're going to have to do the exact same thing on the privatization of healthcare and on this Get It Done Wrong Act. And uh, I would add one more group to that, uh, the media, the journalists who provided. Yes, thank you for that. 
Yes. Yeah, because I relied on them heavily as I was trying to help with some of these files from my, yes. my little perch. Uh, I want to thank you so much, Mike, for reminding us of what it will take, giving us the hope that we can do it. And most importantly, for your assessment of Ontario as being a caring place, because I got to tell you, between the people I work with and the people that I volunteer with and the people in my family and my neighborhood, there is a, a, a sense of almost despondency and despair. And uh, we can't let that happen if we need to ramp up and raise our voices and organize and work together to get the kind of equitable, caring community that we all deserve in this province. So thank you so much, Mike Schreiner, again, from the um, Green Party. I'm glad you got a colleague there with you, <laughs> a couple of colleagues, and I'm, I'm glad that you are uh, in, a, in a, despite the frustration of today and what Ford did to you, uh, certainly people know what you're doing and there are other platforms to get your message out and to get support. So thank you for being on the O Show, Mike. And thank all of you for watching and for subscribing across Canada uh, as it happens in Ontario it, you know we see it happening across the country some of these issues and and we all need to raise our voices to protect our country and our climate as well thanks so much Mike when you care about current affairs it's on the old show and when you want to get clear what's going on here it's on the old show if you like to stay in the know tune yourself in to the oh show it's the old show Laura Babcock's the old show with a lot of great guests she puts them to the test on the old show there's no doubt they'll be calling them out on the old show stand for something or fall for it all Ontario hear the call on the old show it's a podcast the old show Laura Babcock's the old show stay informed with the old show old show